My name is Lori Steelink. I'm an artist and I'm also a curator and I'm sitting here in my live workspace also known as Cornelius Projects but also as my personal um, studio and live space. Um, I've been in living in San Pedro for the past eight years. Um, I'm originally from Tucson, Arizona. I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. San Pedro in some weird way actually resembles Tucson. There's something about the, the light, not the ocean, because Tucson is a, in a desert, but um, there's a, something about the vibe too that is very reminiscent of Tucson. San Pedro is an interesting place besides that there's something that resembles Tucson. <laughs> um, I came down here because I was offered this incredible space and um, I am thankful to Lida and Austin Lowry for um, allowing me to be here and to use it as my studio space but also use it as a space to offer exhibitions and events to the community of San Pedro. My heritage in a sense is that I was uh, given up for adoption by my Akmila Atta mother who couldn't raise me um, and uh, spent six months in, a, in an orphanage um, and then was adopted by a, a Euro-American family uh, with, who were very progressive um, uh, civil rights um, and anti-war activists uh, who had adopted a, a younger, um, by, by a sister who is my older sister, but um, two years before I was adopted, um, she's an uh, African-American um, uh, child who was given up for adoption because her mother uh, had, uh, her Euro-American mother had, had become pregnant with a black man. And this was in the late 50s and her family did not want her to keep my sister. So my sister was the first uh, uh, child in the Steeling family, and I was the second child. Um, my birth father, who I don't know, who never um, claimed responsibility for me, uh, he may be um, of uh, Scottish or English descent, I'm not sure, but uh, my mother was Akmel Atam, and I did meet her when I was 40 which would be 20 years ago. And um, from that point on, I started having regular conversations with her, writing and getting to know her family. And to this day, I maintain relationships with at least one of the sisters who I find to be um, most sisterly and, uh, and we get along great and it's really fun to, to talk to her. I just talked to her yesterday. My heritage and my ancestry not only come from being Native American uh, by birth, but I also come from a family who are steeped in um, good causes for uh, furthering equality amongst all human beings. And my grandfather uh, supported labor unions and spent two years in San Quentin prison uh, because of his beliefs for, for organized labor. All these various factors enter into my work, but um, the, the opportunity to present my work in, in Indian markets lately has been a really eye-opening experience given that all the, all the artists that are presenting works are Native American. And I have to say, um, it's a very relaxed uh, uh, environment um, and I think what I'm finding is that the environment in which I'm, I've, I've consciously uh, made an effort to, to present my work in is, is, has been very welcoming as opposed to being um, uh, not so welcoming. <laughs> Growing up in Tucson, I had many advantages in uh, terms of education, um, as ex what they would refer to as extracurricular, which would be art and music. Um, I was uh, in influenced, um, in a sense, by my surroundings, but also influenced by my parents to pursue that, not necessarily as a job, but as a practice, as a young child. 
And so I had uh, art classes and music classes. I played the flute up until the time I was in my, well, studied classical music and played pretty regularly, practicing every day um, of the week um, until I was in my first year of college. Um, I did take art classes in elementary school, except for private art classes, uh, which were given by one of the uh, mothers of one of my elementary school friends. And in junior high school, I took one art class, and in high school, I didn't take any art classes. I took theater. By the time I got to college, and my parents wanted me to study something was, that was practical, that would earn me a living, I just was not wanting to continue school, <laughs> nor did I really want to do anything practical. Um, but I did need a job, and so I started working at a hospital as a transportation attendant and met a bunch of misfits um, like myself um, who had difficulties in high school um, and who were very steeped in the music and the punk rock scene that was happening in Tucson, as well as the alternative art scene. And during that time, I was playing in bands. I played in about five different bands. Um, I started making flyers. I was the worst graphic designer, though. I just didn't have it that kind of eye or uh, composition that was um, needed for. I, occasionally, I succeeded. There were a lot of mistakes. Um, but uh, I did have the ability to make a mess. And <laughs> And it was through that and playing in bands and performing that allowed me to have a certain freedom um, in making, uh, making what, I, what I perceived to be artwork. And I met a young artist who was going to the San Francisco Art Institute at that time and who influenced me to go to school there. And I did, and from the San Francisco Art Institute um, and uh, into graduate school, I went to uh, Mason Grove School of the Arts at Rutgers in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and I studied with a Fluxus artist. And in in uh, art history class in, at the San Francisco Art Institute, I was introduced to Fluxus, but not really steeped in it. And I really didn't know too much about it until I started studying with this person named Jeffrey Hendricks, who I would later become his assistant after graduating from graduate school and really getting immersed in what Fluxus was and who the people were that were participating in, in the what was called the Fluxus Collective. Um, the uh, originator, so to speak, was a man from Lithuania named George Machunis. And um, he lived in New York and he was a graphic designer. But he had this idea that was sort of like a, a uh, reaction to minimal, minimalism and this notion of artists having these incredible egos and making work about um, very minimalist ideas, color, shape, form, and how that wasn't really addressing our situation culturally, uh, socially, politically, and he wanted to he wanted to include those ways of thinking in what he did as a as a practicing artist, as a practicing curator. Um, he was almost like a, a circus uh, leader, like a, uh, or a director, um, where he, with other people like Yoko Ono, even John Cage, um, were kind of distilling ideas, um, very simple everyday life actions into these kind of poetic offerings that would, be, would become uh, performances or a score. We are here uh, in an exhibition called The Naked Mind, curated by George Ann Dean, who is also an artist. Um, this is my piece behind me, and it is called Medicine. The theme of this exhibition is based on a number of things, at all, but all those things have to do with our our psychological state um, as artists and as uh, human beings in this world and functioning um, in, in today uh, with all the things that we are bombarded with. Um, and we are also, as humans, um, all dealing with some kind of trauma that have, has existed throughout our lives 
and may exist now if we're not addressing it. But for artists, it's actually a really good and fun way to address um, these issues that we've been carrying around with us for most of our lives. As far as my work is concerned in this exhibition, medicine, medicine refers to plant medicine for uh, all intents and purposes um, in this particular case. The medicine cabinet that is to my right um, addresses um, the idea of an actual medicine cabinet full of boxes that may resemble boxes that would be in anyone's medicine cabinet. But these boxes for me are, con well, first of all, they're constructed out of deconstructed paint, deconstructed paintings of mine. And through that process, I decided to make folded boxes that would go into the medicine cabinet and address this idea of something that we consume on a daily basis to make us this way or that way or feel better or mellow us out or make us go to sleep. Um, for me, these medicine boxes are more akin to helping one see, helping myself see through the murkiness that exists here that we're all swimming in um, that relates to how we feel, our tactile senses, our relating to people, our relationship to sound and to temperature and to give some sort of guidance to help one feel as though they belong. And that also comes with a doorway or a portal or a window or an entrance or an exit, depending on how you look at it, which I'm standing in front of now, which is that ability to be able to shift one's mind so that you don't necessarily have to go down a deep spiral of thinking horrible things about yourself, horrible things about humanity, but to be able to take what is being presented to you and not make assumptions based on the trauma either that you've suffered or the things that you've been taught that aren't necessarily the best way to react to uh, all sorts of situations. Um, I'm a meditator and I've been doing this for a number of years and I find that being able to concentrate on breathing has done exceptional things for my spirit and for all the relationships that I have with not only just other people, but everything around me. Um, this is an opportunity for you to meditate uh, as a viewer of this piece to imagine in some way or to actually create that sort of situation where you step into another way of thinking, another way of acceptance. The deer over to my left is made up of a number of elements that I have collected, including the medicine cabinet, which I collected as well. Um, their found objects is what I see as a guide. So as a viewer, you can take this guide, this friend, this, this being as your, um, as your guide, <laughs> um, as a, a being that will help to lead you through if you need a hand, because don't we all need a hand <laughs> at some point? Um, and the feathers are cut also from deconstructed paintings, the regalia that surrounds the neck of the deer. Um, in a number of uh, healing communities, um, modalities, in particular indigenous um, healing, feathers are used to help to cleanse um, um, the body and the air and um, the regalia on the deer is has this um, uh, intention, as far as I'm concerned, to be 
of that for cleansing and for healing. So you may take something from the medicine cabinet. Uh, you have your, in a sense, spirit guide, and you may enter into the portal, into the doorway, and to see things in a different way, in a different light. Through the process of making these um, pieces that use uh, deconstructed um, works, paintings of old paintings of mine, um, and then making the um, uh, the figures, the really simple um, sort of these wacky abstract figures, which then this has kind of led to, which isn't so. It is abstract still, but this is a hat um, that uh, is still a long ways from being done. Um, but the idea of in some way possibly doing stop motion animation of these figures to create a, a, a story, a dialogue um, that will um, communicate um, an idea or a, a, a story um, that's maybe possibly based on um, traditional stories from my tribe uh, is, a, is an area that I'm interested in, in going into. Um, I think also the application of these, uh, the, these pieces that are the leftovers from the medicine cabinet piece and the, uh, or the medicine piece with the deer as well um, lend itself to quite possibly making even prints that would, um, I could do um, uh, through silkscreen or lithography. But I mean, ultimately, I think uh, more, I'm, I'm more interested in, in the idea of, do, of storytelling. And so that is um, an area that um, I think I would like to pursue. Feminism <laughs> in my work probably stems from my mother who, who raised me, who was a hardcore feminist, um, very hardcore. <laughs> And uh, you know, she was she was somebody who stood up for a lot of people's rights. Um, but in particular, me as a young girl, I was one of the first people in my junior high school to take shop class and to um, uh, be in the mechanical drawing class. I was the only girl and the first girl in, like I said, in my class. Um, to she she was a strong influence as was my grandmother too who was also a wobbly and a, a garment worker in in New York. Um, I went to the San Francisco Art Institute and one of my teachers was Angela Davis too and she's somebody who I really look to and respect and admire uh, what she's done throughout her life and uh, I wish I would have been a better student at the time when I was going to school that I was more interested in in the um, in the philosophy, <laughs> but I was a punk rocker then, but I really appreciate all the things that she did say and do, and, um, and, and uh, she was one of my uh, advisors when I was on independent study. So, but I do admire her greatly. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, as a young, uh, budding uh, musician in Tucson, Arizona, I remember being interviewed by the the local paper, um, Arizona Daily Star, and saying, uh, you know, it doesn't it do doesn't matter that I'm a girl. I'm just one of the, I'm a, I'm in the band. I'm I'm I play music, and that's what I do, and that's what I should be respected for. <laughs> um, but uh, I do I do appreciate uh, the women that are, um, you know lecturing, writing books, and addressing the inequalities that exist, um, uh, just with women, but people of color, too. So how do I learn from trial and error by exactly that? <laughs> In fact, some of the best work comes out of error. Some of the best work is made from accidents. Um, so that's how I learned. It's a bit the <laughs> The more accidents, the better. <laughs> I, I mean, definitely. And it's taken me a while, you know? I'm like thinking about, like, I couldn't have done this, like, even 10 years ago. Because I hadn't quite, I hadn't quite arrived at what I, what I'm doing now, you know? And I think what I'm doing now is probably 
the best work that I've done in a long time. And I think it's because I'm older and I am not, there's, there's, there's no pretense. It's, it is what it is. And I hate saying that. I hate that saying. Sorry, I didn't say hate. I dislike that saying. It is what it is. It's, it, it is because I made it this way. And um, a lot of thought went into it. And, um, and sometimes, even though, you know, it's like this back in the trial and error thing, it's like you have this picture. It's okay, okay, this is going to look a certain way. But then surprisingly, it doesn't look like how you thought it would. It looks even better or it succeeds on a different level. So I like it when, it, when that happens. Um, yeah, I mean, like, those things were literally, okay, okay, what am I going to do now? And, you know, like, okay, let me just glue this cardboard together. Okay, let me just add these pieces together. And then it's like I had this thing sitting around. This was from one of the photographs that I did, that I printed for my exhibition at, at Angel's Gate, the Coming Into Being show. And um, it's actually kind of a funny picture because it's, me standing next to this horse with my arm around its neck. And um, I was so in love with horses at the time. And wanting to disappear with that horse, you know, wanting to just like leave everything. That was my, that was, that was my fantasy, I suppose, at that age. And I added these little jeweled tears after I cut the head out of the picture because the print, something happened with the print and I couldn't, I stopped the printing process. So I had this face. And I kept thinking, well, how am I going to use this crying nine-year-old image of me? And then I started cutting around it and made it more like kind of devilish looking with the, um, with the, with the pointy ears. Maybe nobody recognizes it as that. But I kept, this, this, this image just kept looking at me, going, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Okay, you're, okay. It's, it's time now to, to use me rather than just having me sit around being this crying face. And so with all these little pieces and then this, this piece of paper that I added that was like a little collar, um, I started adding on to this. And, it, and now it becomes kind of almost like a crown. Um, a thinking cap of releasing my nine-year-old trauma <laughs> as a young girl who felt like she didn't belong anywhere. She didn't connect with anybody except for maybe a horse who wasn't, didn't belong to her, but she wanted it. But um, I'm feeling like uh, I'm I'm able to to release that that pain that was there, that was present through, through making this. So how do I respond to boredom? I don't get bored. <laughs> and I don't get bored because I've got, I'm living in this amazing place. The amazing place that is this world, this environment, this universe that it produces you know, air that I can breathe and water that I can drink, water that I can swim in and that I can go kayaking in or, or mountains or hills or cliffs that I can walk along. Um, I, it's not, it's not boredom. It's, I go for uh, regeneration on some level. If I need to, like, if I, if I'm, here and maybe this isn't going as well or maybe I glued something that I didn't mean to glue or I tore something that I didn't mean to tear and rather than progressing on this I will get up and I will go outside either in the back I will go for a walk and I I can honestly say every time I do that I I've it, it gives me more material it gives me more more ideas for making work and for living this life that, that I'm so honored to be living. Um, I mean, we are living an incredible uh, a life. It's almost like a dream that we can exist here. And um, 
recognizing that on a daily basis, on a, on, on a, on a regular basis throughout the day is um, all part of that art, I think, because it's like a, a, a way of living and that's, it's an artful way of living, I think, if you, can, if you can look at it, if you can address that. You can find beauty, you can find um, the opposite in anything and, it's not, and everything in between. Uh, depending on how you look at it and depending upon your frame of mind. Um, but I think being in nature is such a great influence and um, uh, using your imagination, uh, and writing, uh, but these aren't fighting boredom. It, that's, just, that's not fighting boredom. That's just there are activities that help uh, propel you to the next thing. There's always that next thing. 